welcome everyone to this very large room. Um, I think we've got quite an exciting session ahead and some new data being presented, which hasn't been publicly presented before. Um, this is a crucial topic, and I think that we're really grappling with how to, to deal with this problem. And, and there's some interesting lessons that I think are coming out of certain Sentinel programs and projects that is, is teaching us how to think about this. So um, I'd like to invite our first speaker to come up to the floor um, and presenting some interesting uh, results from a, a project which was recently completed um, by the CDC. All right, fantastic. Uh, great to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Seaton and others here for um, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, basically, this uh, question was addressed for the MDR-TB guidelines work group for ATS, IDSA, ERS. Um, uh, this is something that's a long project that's going on where we have about 22 PICO questions that we're addressing in a grade-based manner for those guidelines, and we're hoping that the guidelines will be published by World TB Day next year. And this is just one of the questions that's being addressed. So um, moving right along, uh, it, where I'm going to be speaking on effect effectiveness of regimens for treatment of uh, DRTB infection results. And it's not just household contacts. I'm just, this is the topic that was given, but the actual meta-analysis includes um, all studies that looked at MDRTB contacts and either treated or didn't treat. So uh, no financial disclosures. Um, just as a quick background, evidence-based recommendations, as you know, um, are lacking for MDR-TB contacts with presumed uh, MDR, latent TB infection. There's not been any randomized control data yet. Uh, all the data that we have are observational at this point, but recommendations are still needed. And there are three RCTs that are underway. Um, I'm listing them right here. One. Uh, TB champ, levofloxacin versus placebo in children and adolescents, VQIN, levo versus placebo also in children and adolescents, and then um, Phoenix, which is actually really interesting, looking at delaminid versus isoniazid for, um, I think it's uh, uh, children and, and adults. So we have the results coming, but they won't be available until 2021. So if you look at the um, review quickly of past or current guidelines, the last guideline that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put out were from 1992 and then from 2000, basically recommending that no treatment for MDR latent TB infection um, would be an option or six to 12 months of treatment with two or more medications to which the isolate of the source case is susceptible. Um, and the combinations that were suggested would be PZA, ethambutol, PZA, fluoroquinolone, um, and it, we also at that time suggested that fluoroquinolone should only be used in children or uh, pregnant females if the benefits outweigh the risks because the risks, risks, especially in children, were felt to be greater at that time, and that the other second-line drugs are not recommended. So there was no recommendation at this time from CDC for monotherapy with any drug. Um, there are other uh, guide guidelines for treatment of MDR-LTBI, I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're not very comprehensive, mainly suggesting there's insufficient data and that um, it's not cost effective and that studies need to be done. So I'm, I'm going to leave this at that for an in interest of time since I only have 20 minutes. Now the CURRI drug resistant guide also gives recommendations for the treatment of MDR contacts. This is actually a section that I'd written in the first uh, CURRI drug resistant guide that's been updated and does suggest that there are some different potential regimens that can be given for MDR-LTBI uh, treatment. And these are the uh, recommendations. Of course, we're talking about MDR contacts, so we're not going to use erythromycin. But um, the potential regimens that were suggested were fluoroquinolone uh, plus ethambutol, fluoroquinolone ethionamide, uh, and even fluoroquinolone monotherapy was recommended. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. So our PICO question was basically, um, among contacts to infectious MDR-TB patients with latent TB infection or presumed latent TB infection, should latent TB infection treatment compare, be given compared with no medical treatment? So those are the sort of basic PICO question. And if you know what a PICO question is, you have a population 
all persons with LTBI or presumed LTBI having contact to infectious MDR-TB. And then the intervention is MDR-TB uh, presumed treatment for MDR-LTBI. The comparison is no effective MDR-LTBI treatment. And the outcomes that we looked at were incidence, treatment completion, treatment discontinuation due to adverse effects, and cost effectiveness. So those are the four outcomes. Um, so we had performed a systematic review of studies published from January 1994 through December 2014. And we included studies that reported on persons having contact to infectious MDR-TB. Again, not all household contacts. Contacts um, that had documented LTBI test reactivity or presumed um, MDR-LTBI for children less than five or PLHIV, um, treated or untreated MDR-LTBI and TB incidence rates. So the endpoints, as I already said, were TB incidence, treatment completion, discontinuation due to adverse events, and cost effectiveness. Effective treatment was defined as receiving greater than or equal to one medication to which the MDR-TB strain of the uh, source case was uh, likely susceptible. And we uh, selected studies that compared treatment versus non-treatment outcomes, performed a meta-analysis. We searched uh, three different databases, PubMed, Embase, and Cochrane Library for key, the following keywords listed here, excluded case reports with less than 10 participants, and studies that only reported clearly on diagnosis or treatment of MDR-TB itself. And we used um, uh, individual study definitions uh, for contacts or LTBI based on whatever the studies um, uh, define this as being. So if you look at this uh, systematic review process, uh, basically, we started with um, 95 references and then excluded studies based on our exclusion uh, criteria, got down to 24 uh, reported studies, articles, and two conference abstracts. We were not able to find the conference abstracts, and one article was due, uh, ex excluded due to insufficient data, so we ended up with six studies that had a comparison of L MDR LTBI treatment versus no treatment. And then we had 15 studies that either looked at, they were cohort studies that just looked at treatment and outcomes or no treatment and outcomes following patients. So basically looking at TB incidents, um, we had five comparison studies total because we excluded one because it used a methodology of a registry match which really is a quite different methodology than the other studies and may have introduced a lot of heterogeneity. And it's not as accurate because of people who move and are never identified in that same area. So registry match is really not a great way to find incident cases. So we had three comparison studies that had any TB incidents at all. BAMRA, which is actually my study, and uh, SCAF were from higher incidence areas. Um, and then the rest, the other three, this one, Denholm, was from a low incidence setting. So you can see that, um, I'm going to show you the combined effects in just a second, but um, you can see that in BAMRA, uh, it looked like there was a relative risk of 0 0.02 favoring treatment, and a relative risk in Denholm of 0.82 favoring treatment, relative risk of 0.24 favoring treatment. In other words, there would be, if you looked at the BAMRA study results, there's a 98% de um, protective effect from getting the treatment. So I can go into that more. Um, okay, then there were two studies that actually had no uh, TB incidence at all in either arm. And again, these were done in low incidence settings, so you, you may not expect there to be cases in either arm. So that was one of the limitations. Um, this is just a forest plot showing again uh, the relative risks that I had pointed out there. And um, then uh, let me just show you, this is a little bit more of a difficult um, forest plot, but essentially, I'll, let me sum this up. So when, you, when we looked at the six studies comparing MDR, LTPI treatment versus no effective treatment, and excluded the one registry match that I mentioned, the pool TB incidence from treatment was 1.1% um, in the studies with treatment, and 14.3% in the studies that had no treatment and followed people. Um, so if you looked at the results, essentially, um, we, I showed the individual study risk reductions, but um, the pooled uh, risk reduction was 90% when you put those three studies together that, uh, that had the individual risk reductions. Heterogeneity was a factor, 
and it was a limitation of the study given that these are observational data. Um, and the power to detect TB incidence was only 1% in two of the studies. Now if you looked at, we had 10 studies again that treated patients and followed them longitudinally. And we had five that didn't treat patients who were contacts and followed them. So what we did was we looked at, um, there was only TB incidence in only two of the treatment studies. Again, that's a big limitation. Many of these studies showed no progression to active disease um, because they're very low incidence areas. So uh, we found that, um, um, and then we had the five studies that had no effective treatment and followed patients. Essentially, the aggregated incidence in the three treatment studies was 3% versus 3.7% in the studies that had no treatment. The quality essentially was very low based on our grade process. Um, and I'm not going to say too much more in the interest of time. But we did these evidence profiles and found, again, through the grade process, that the quality of uh, evidence was overall was very low given the observational nature of the data. So looking at treatment completion, uh, there were 13 studies that uh, gave um, uh, the, the data for treatment completion. And here's a forest plot showing what treatment completion percentages were in, across these 13 studies. Um, you know, some, stu basically, the pooled average treatment completion from 13 studies was 68%. Um, and here are the different uh, treatment completion percentages in the 13 studies. Again, the quality of evidence was extremely low, very low, or low. The studies were uh, pros prospective observational, retrospective reviews. Um, and or registry ma matches or case series. Uh, not all the studies that we included reported on treatment completion, and completion really depended upon the regimen uh, which affected treatment discontinuation, which I'm going to get to in just a second. Again, the grade table showed a low quality of evidence. The next thing we looked at was treatment discontinuation due to adverse events, and I think this is probably one of the most interesting parts of the, the uh, publication. So essentially, um, all the pooled average treatment discontinuation across all studies was 19 percent. Overall treatment discontinuation with quite a range as you can see and you're going to see that this is very dependent on the treatment regimen chosen and, and, and only 12 studies reported on treatment discontinuation um, and again this is just showing the different percentages of treatment discontinuation across the studies and the uh, quality of evidence was very low but then when you looked at stratified by age, we found a difference. So essentially, um, there were four studies uh, performed in age less than or equal to 15, and the treatment, overall treatment discontinuation was 5% across those four studies. There were eight studies looking at older patients, and the treatment discontinuation was 33% in those over age 15. Um, so the, basically, the relative risk, here, let me get to the next slide. So, um, this is just saying what I just said. Essentially, adverse event treatment discontinuation was 5% in kids under less than or equal to 15 compared with 33% in those over age 15. Here are the different percentages. And the, the relative risk of treatment discontinuation for children was 0.14. In other words, there is 86% uh, more likely to complete treatment among children. So, if your children actually did much better. And we always have thought that in terms of completing treatment. Again, the overall grade showed uh, low quality of evidence. And then if you looked at treatment discontinuation by regimen, this is where it gets really interesting. Um, because we find that these are different regimens that were used across the studies. Um, and if you looked at um, any regimen containing PZA, uh, all PZA containing regimens, adverse events were 66% and stopped of treatment due to adverse events was 51%. Um, and if you looked at PZA fluoroquinolone regimens, which we all know, for those of us who treat MDR contacts, are really, really difficult to tolerate, we find treatment discontinuation, or any adverse event was 85%, I believe, there, and then adverse event stop was 66%. Um, compared to adverse events for all regimens being 45%, and treatment discontinuation for all regimens being 20%. So it certainly looks like there's an association for treatment discontinuation with PZA-containing regimens. This is saying uh, something very similar, essentially. 66% uh, discontinuation for PZA fluoroquinolone. As I said, PZA-EMB, 25%. This is adults. 
and those under less than or equal to 15, the discontinuation rates were also very high, 42% in children for PZA fluoroquinolone. So that regimen's not tolerated that well in kids either. So um, if you look at uh, uh, the summary for this, uh, essentially there was 11 treatment studies that um, uh, gave data on treatment discontinuation due to adverse events. All PZA-containing regimens had the highest adverse events and discontinuation. Fluoroquinolone-containing regimens had high adverse events, but only 2% resulted in treatment discontinuation. That means that the side effects are being managed in patients who are taking fluoroquinolones. Um, the relative risk was 27 of adverse event treatment discontinuation using PZA-containing regimens versus fluoroquinolone uh, regimens without PZA. And in children less than 15, as I said, tr treatment discontinuation was low with PZA EMB or fluoroquinolone EMB, but high with PZA fluoroquinolone. And the grade, again, sh um, process showed uh, low quality of evidence. Um, for the same reasons, observational data, et cetera, wide range of adverse events, a discontinuation by regimen, studies did not often report outcomes by person time, um, et cetera. So if you looked at cost effectiveness, um, oops, okay, yeah, just, uh, I'll be done in just a couple minutes here. There, was, there have been two studies published, Holland and Fox. Uh, if you looked at Holland, they used uh, the following MDRTB societal cost, whereas we used 225,000. Uh, the most cost-effective regimen based on modeling was actually one using a uh, delaminid. Fluoroquinolone ethambutol, ethionamide, and fluoroquinolone alone. PZA regimens were least cost-effective. In Fox, it was also modeling, and they used this following societal cost. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, one second. I'll get this to advance. Sorry. Um, and found that fluoroquinolone was cost-saving and remained cost-saving even if the f effectiveness was as low as 10%. So for our results, um, skimming over this, again, quality of evidence is low. I'm, I'm going to skip over the tables and just go to the, I'm having a little trouble advancing this, just a sec. Okay. Okay. So we used MDR, MDRTB societal cost of 225,000, excluding death. We used our own data for adverse event discontinuation, which I just showed you, and completion rates from our analysis. Conclusions are the most effective regimen was fluoroquinolone ethionamide, but significantly more expensive than all other regimens. Fluoroquinolone EMB was the most effective and cost-saving regimen, followed by fluoroquinolone alone, then by PZA EMB. PZA fluoroquinolone regimen was particularly toxic um, as measured by the discontinuation and prevented about half as many TB cases as the most cost-effective option. And there are estimated cost savings in treating versus not treating for all MDR LTBI regimens because of the high um, uh, societal cost. And the recommendations, um, basically our proposed recommendations that will be coming out in the guidelines are that among those um, with presumed MDR LTBI, there's probable effectiveness and cost effectiveness of preventing MDR-TB through treatment of MDR-LTBI. For MDR-LTBI treatment of contacts, we suggest six to 12 months of treatment with a fluoroquinolone alone or with second drug, excluding perizinamide based on uh, a source case isolate drug susceptibility testing with the following regimen, six to 12 months of fluoroquinolone plus or minus another medication, should include, exclude PZA, the rationales here. And for children, TB medications in general are better tolerated Oops, sorry, just sorry, one second. This thing is quite, okay, sorry. Um, that for contacts to pre-XDRTB, consider PZA EMB if effective. But of course we know that most of our XDR cases are gonna be resistant to PZA or EMB. And the fluoroquinolone regimen should be levofloxacin for children and the grade of evidence is very low quality. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Really, really interesting findings. I really appreciate you coming and sharing um, these findings with us. Um, we have some time for some questions. I'd really like to generate some discussion around this, and um, we have uh, the speaker here to answer all your questions. So if there are thoughts or questions, it would be great to hear them. Great. Do you want to come to the microphone, for you, just so everyone can hear you? If anyone else has a question, please come up and stand behind. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation, very nice presentation. Uh, I think your presentation will be a very good background for a better study, because you already said there was a lot of heterogeneity, and you said also 
level of evidence is quite low. I wanted to ask something which you didn't uh, give to us. Amplification of resistance. Are you not worried about that? Oh, and then yeah. if, I, if, if, if my child is less than five and continues to live with, my mom, with me and I'm coughing up TB and I'm not uh, sputum converting, isn't there a risk of me actually infecting my child with active TB while I'm, the child's on maybe or fluoroquinone and then end up uh, amplifying the child's resistance? Yeah, so, so you're, you're just worried about acquired resistance with treating, yeah. So I think essentially um, if active disease is excluded, uh, and, you know, I would personally, I think a chest x-ray is required for excluding active disease, a symptom review, anything abnormal in chest x-ray, sputa collection before any of these regimens are used. And I think the data, even from just INH, uh, shows that when disease is excluded, that we don't have a risk of acquired resistance with treating LTBI. And I'm sure others in the audience could also speak to that. There's a couple of studies, right, Dr. Scaff, suggesting that we don't have acquired resistance if active disease is excluded with INH? Yeah. So I, I, I guess all I can say is never treat LTBI without excluding active disease. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm referring to the fact that the child continues to be exposed, and if the, the, primary, uh, the parent doesn't culture convert, maybe he or she is not on a regimen actually treating their TB, they still have a, a possibility of infecting that child with yeah. active MD error while the child is on monoprophylaxis uh, I see and then amplifying saying. the resistance now. Yeah, I see. So you're saying if they have continued exposure, exactly, yeah. then putting them on monotherapy could potentially lead to disease with uh, acquired, I don't know, I mean, uh, I think at least in the U.S., we wouldn't allow a child to be in contact with a case that's ongoing infectious. And I know now that I'm in India that everywhere else around the world, no one is isolating patients and doing what we do in the U.S. And so it's a good point. I don't know. Dr. Scaff, do you have any thought about that? Not using LTBI regimens in kids when they have ongoing exposure to the adult. No, I think uh, if you just think of, of, of prophylaxis or preventive therapy, um, what is the point of preventive therapy is actually to give it while the person is still infectious also, because um, there, will, there would be no point in giving prophylaxis or preventive therapy if, if um, there's no further infection. Um, my, my personal feeling is that as, as long as the child did not have tuberculosis in the beginning, even if the adult is, continues to to expectorate um, the organism as long as the child is on fluoroquinolone should be protected and not develop disease. That's, that's yeah. actually the point. Um, otherwise, uh, there is no point for, for preventive therapy in any case. Yeah. I mean, we call, uh, you know, window therapy when, but we don't have continued exposure to the child. If the child is negative on an LTBI test, and still within that eight to 10 week period where they could become positive, we put them on window therapy. But I, I, don't, I don't think we have many situations in the US where we have ongoing exposure of small children in the household. So I don't know if anybody else wants to comment, but I think we might thought. need to take this uh, for, uh, offline yeah. for okay. later, but it's an interesting discussion. Um, I think we'll, we'll close this speak and, thank um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, and next, we're going to ask um, the presentation from the MSF team. Um, do we have? Great. Um, to come and explain their um, findings from their work in Tajikistan. I have uh, no conflict of interest. Um, for some people who maybe don't know Tajikistan, I show a little small background uh, for Tajikistan. Uh, it's a very small country in Central Asia, and it's only recently uh, um, uh, MSF is. Uh, 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 um, uh, is pushing for the new drugs uh, in children, and that is why I think now uh, it's coming to l limelight. Um, so overall, Tajikistan, um, it's a population of around 8.5 million, and uh, overall TB incidence uh, as per WHO estimate is around 87 per 100,000. But uh, MDR, it has a high incidence of uh, MDR-TB. Mm? 
approximately 1,300 cases uh, per year. Um, so far, uh, the drug resistance surveillance is not yet established in Tajikistan. Uh, but definitely, the, for 2017, uh, uh, the DST results from the National Reference Lab showed an increasing TB burden. So it was confirmed 35% uh, uh, of MDR cases uh, in new cases and 67% in retreatment cases. So an average household size in Tajikistan is around uh, 6.3. So you can imagine uh, with such high TB MDR burden, tens of thousands of people are at risk or exposed to MDR TB. Um, mm, so uh, we started uh, together with the uh, uh, National TB program, we, uh, together with uh, MSF and National TB program, we implemented uh, active case finding protocol uh, uh, for the uh, 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 contacts exposed to DRTB uh, in January 2013 uh, and 16. And uh, uh, what we are going to uh, uh, show is just how we implemented this program and what are our results for last 18 months. So, so this, um, most of you have seen this uh, cascade already. Eh? Just we want to stress if you see the estimated incidence of MDR cases versus the notified, you see it's a huge diagnostic gap. So this is just to show you that how is it is important, uh, there is a need of um, new interventions of case finding. So the next three slides are just, uh, I will just try to briefly inform what we actually did. Uh, so, so this is what we say, this, what, what is the activities which we did. Uh, so MSF is working, uh, actually we have a very small cohort of pediatric TB and we are working only in a few pilot sites. So it's a, not a whole country we are present. We are present in four districts and there is where we implemented this. So uh, the, the main steps which are, I think, crucial for any contact tracing program. So the, what we did differently, I will just try to point out. So first thing we start with is a preparation of the list of the patients. Actually, who are we want to prioritize? Eh? So of course, uh, through the TB registers, we work out together with MOH and we prepare the list. But then we further prioritize. Eh? Out of those patients, we prioritize the families with children less than five years, families with pregnant women, large family size, as well as the index case is DR, because our is the DR program. So we really prioritize only DR patients. Um, and uh, if the index case is HIV positive, and if it has in, having diabetes mellitus, or, as a, or any other immunocompromising disease. So this is the first thing what we do. Then, then working through the uh, ambulatory cards, the team uh, tries to know the address of the patient, phone number of the patient, and then the MOH try, team tries to coordinate a home, home visit. So, and this is important, so home visit. Uh, here, this is the sole responsibility of nurses. No doctor is involved here. So this is what we do, home visits, is because it's a DR uh, uh, patient's uh, contacts. So we organize home visits every six months for two years. So we have maintained a database uh, for each visit and then accordingly uh, uh, we do six monthly visits. And what do we do basically? It's, it's basically involves the interview. We just want to know what is the uh, living conditions of the family and then we do the symptom screening. Simple symptom screening uh, with the loss of weight, appetite, cough uh, and temperature. And then we also do the physical examination just looking for the lymph nodes. Uh. Anybody having uh, one or more symptom, then that patient is referred immediately to the polyclinic. So uh, what other things we do is, of course, before we leave, we organize the, uh, fix the next appointment with the family. We do also the awareness sessions for the families, uh, so that at least know what is TB, trans uh, uh, prevention, uh, tr transmission, symptoms, and in case they have symptoms, where to go, which nearest polyclinic they should report to. And, and the third step is important. So this is what we can say, it's a, so we establish referral pathways. So any individual who has one or more symptom of active disease is referred to the polyclinic where MDs are present, the doctors are present. 
So basically, they are further evaluated basically by chest radiography and sputum sampling, including uh, uh, sputum induction for the kids less than five years, as well as uh, anybody, uh, uh, any child, uh, if he's not able to produce sputum, irrespective of the age, we do it. So there, uh, at the polyclinic level, if there is a X-ray available, we do it. Everything is paid in Tajikistan. MSF reimburses the uh, uh, diagnostic costs. And if there is no X-ray available uh, in the polyclinic, then we have a pre-identified uh, hospitals and polyclinics where we refer them. And when you say anybody who is referred out of the polyclinic, MSF supports them with the transportation costs. So the objective is of this referral pathway is within one week, there's a uh, MOH team and MSF team has to coordinate that within seven days, the suspect is and the, uh, the, uh, the individual with the signs and symptoms of active disease is properly evaluated. Once uh, we collect the results, the MOH doctor presented to the cl clinical concilium and uh, as soon as it is uh, confirmed or presumed TB MDR uh, 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 approved by the concilium, we the, the, the patient enters the MOH system. Mm. And MSF does take care of the kids less than 18 years and all the family contacts we identify from our contact tracing activities. So this is, and quickly on the results. It's not going, James? Ah, yes. So here, so this is in 18 months, 3742 family members were screened from 766 uh, families. And 64% uh, uh, of them were children less than 18 years. And 18% were DS contacts. So same like I said, we prioritize the patients with the DR. But when, if the teams have time, we do also do contact tracing for the DS patients. So if you see 20% from 3742 family members screened reported at least uh, uh, one symptom. Uh, and uh, additionally, and were evalu uh, evaluated with additional uh, 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 diagnostics. Uh, and uh, the result is we identified 41 patients of active, confirmed, or presumptive TB. And uh, or you can say for every 100 family screen, 5.3 new cases of TB were identified. Or you can say one new TB patient was identified after screening around 92 family contacts. If you look at further division of the 41, 70% were less than um, uh, 18 years. And uh, we found a lot of uh, uh, confirmed or presumed XDR. Uh, it is around uh, uh, 46%. 36% were MDR. And 4.8% uh, pre-XDR and 12.2% were DS. Quickly going to the challenges. The only challenge we faced was basically for the diagnostics. Huh? Because the challenge was for the referral pathway because uh, um, everything is paid in uh, uh, Tajikistan, all MOH system. So we really needed to work uh, on uh, supporting the uh, tests of the, uh, uh, for, uh, for the diagnostics. And uh, again, um, for the sputum induction room, uh, for the sputum induction as well as uh, for the places where there was no X-ray available, then we had to refer them to capital, which is not very far, but then we had to bear the transportation cost also. And the uh, uh, last, which was uh, really a big challenge for us, us was, um, in last one year, we are finding more and more patients from the, uh, during our subsequent visits. For example, the patients what we uh, screened uh, in the beginning, not the patient, the family members what we screened in, the, in, in January, 10 months down the line, we found that the kids were having an, uh, a signs of active disease. So it is basically because of uh, uh, a long waiting list uh, for the XDR patients as well as the uh, uh, MDR patients because uh, uh, the kids have been exposed for a long time. So this was uh, really, really, we were, uh, the teams were struggling and there was a f big challenge for us what to do with, with them. Because we are following them, we are coming, uh, doing the follow-up uh, every six months, but what happens is from the same family six months or one year down the lane, we have two or three 
patient. So that is a really big challenge. So you can say there is, uh, the, uh, the teams have been discussing, yes, there is a need for preventive therapy at least. Uh, and also what we were, there were challenges, yes, we are always missing really, really, uh, uh, there is a need for more sensitive screening tests for the little kids. Quickly for the conclusion, uh, we are finding uh, um, uh, alarming rate of confirmed or presumptive TB uh, among the household contacts in Tajikistan. And uh, as you saw, the high rate of uh, XGR TB is especially concerning. Our findings also uh, confirms there is urgent need for intervention to screen the, uh, the persons exposed to DRTB in the household. Um, as you s um, the active case finding, what we are doing definitely is l we are able to detect new patients. But when we, uh, uh, when we see the risk faced by the household contacts, I think there is a need of additional activities, especially provision of treatment of infection for the DR contacts who are exposed but not uh, yet sick with TB. We also found that, yes, uh, working with household members exposed to DRTB was efficient and effective and can be easily impl implemented with the national TB program. And this, this can be adapted and, pro uh, and implemented anywhere else uh, under program conditions also. Thank you. Great. Any, Any questions? questions? It seems that we have one from Professor Moore. Hello there. Hi. Uh, David Moore, London School of Hygiene. Thank you. Really lovely presentation. You started to answer it, and then I didn't quite get the answer. How many of those 41 cases were co-prevalent cases you found at the start, and how many were detected during subsequent visits? And of those that weren't co-prevalent, how many of them were detected at visits rather than then presented to the health services we, because you told them to? We have not yet analyzed that, definitely. Um, uh, but uh, the thing is now, because it's only 18 months back we started, but now in the last uh, few months, at least especially this year, in last six months, uh, more and more patients uh, we are uh, finding from the same code. I can give you one example, I, I estimate, you can say, think of. In 2017, 70 percent of our current cohort we are finding through contact tracing so means from the same families what we started long time in last year in one year down the lane we are finding new patients so i don't have the exact analysis but we are now finding more and more from the same family what we did and main reason i said is this is basically because we know all these kids have been long time exposed because the xdr New drugs only be introduced two years back. And MSF is the only one who, 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 who used uh, uh, in 2016 the drugs. Eh? And now there is a huge backlog of patients, and we know these all kids are already exposed. Sure. Now, I, I guess what I was trying to do was get a handle on the preventable cases. If we were to give preventive therapy, what proportion of those 41 would be preventable? But we're not quite there No, yet. I don't have that. Um, thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. My name is Renee Ritson from Centers for Disease Control. Um, you have a, a cohort that's been established of your um, exposed children, and you have the source case uh, knowledge. Now, if you look at young kids and um, the epidemiology of TB, as they age and grow into adolescence, there is a period of time where there's an increased risk for TB that is going to be several years out from when you stop uh, observing these kids for the two years. Do you have some means of should those ch children, should those adolescents develop TB, of immediately recognizing that they're a contact so that you know better how to start their TB therapy? Um, uh, no, tell you frankly. <laughs> I mean, it would be a good idea if you could do that because then, then you know this, this yeah. kid is uh, uh, exposed no, to this drug resistance pattern so you don't start with you know, the wrong drugs. Yep, no, I agree on that. Yeah. Thank you. Jay, you have answer to that? No, okay. <laughs> Given, uh, Susan Chris from CDC, given that 18% were uh, drug susceptible, do you have any difference of the 40 ones? I know the power is probably not very great, but of the 40 nuns, one, were there more that were in the drug susceptible versus the drug resistant? Yeah, you can immediately, let's, you can see that because uh, if as you- As far as the later exposed, the ones that came down with it later. Yeah, let me just, can we go can back?
So this is, if you see, um, we can easily say we identified five patients after uh, screening 684 drug susceptible contacts. So if, if you say is, is uh, still, uh, uh, definitely we found more of DR, uh, if this is one per 100 contacts traced, but if you see here, is, is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little l l less than that. Okay, thank you very, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, experiences in Karachi, so we're moving around the world. Hi everybody, I'm going to talk about a pilot study that we conducted in Karachi at Indus Hospital, uh, which is one of the largest uh, TB clinics in Pakistan. And um, uh, the results are, the study is still ongoing, so these are the preliminary results that we are presenting today. And the objective of this study uh, was to assess the proportion of the household members with disease in a household with a pulmonary TB DRTB patient, the effectiveness, uh, to assess the effectiveness of preventive therapy for DRTB in contact started on infection treatment, to assess the risk of disease development in contacts not eligible uh, for infection treatment, to assess the proportion of adverse events, and to assess the treatment completion for infection treatment. The design of the study was prospective evaluation. We enrolled consecutive 100 households uh, with patients with DRTB patients. Uh, the population, we restricted ourselves to those that were living within Karachi and were enrolled for treatment at the Indus Hospital so we could have a good follow-up on them. Uh, the study started in the quarter two of 2016 and will end in quarter two of 2018. The eligibility criteria was quite restrictive. Uh, what we did is we said any child under five years of age will be eligible. Children five to 17 uh, in that age group, those that were had the, that had a positive tuberculin test or were in immunocompromised uh, with either HIV, tuber uh, HIV uh, diabetes, or were malnourished. And for those uh, adults 18 and above, uh, the person had to be immunocompromised, uh, again, with diabetes, HIV, chronic lung disease, or malnourishment to be eligible to uh, get infection treatment. The overall flow, uh, and I'm sorry if this is a small font, uh, we couldn't fit everything in with a larger font, so as soon as a DRTB patient was identified at the clinic and enrolled for treatment, we approached the person and get, got their permission to visit them and their families at home. If the patient permitted, we approached their home, we spent time with the head of the household as well as the rest of the family members explaining the study. We conducted verbal contact screening at the household level and then invited all the family members to come back to the clinic for a clinical evaluation which included chest x-ray, sputum smear exam, gene expert, and any other test that the doctors uh, prescribed. Uh, if they agreed and they came uh, to the clinic, then uh, we excluded tuberculosis disease. And once that was excluded, the rest of the household members were invited to participate in the infection treatment based on the eligibility criteria that I described above. If they decided not to take the uh, infection treatment, we still followed them, and we are continuing to follow that cohort until the study ends. The drug regimen that we used was um, fluoroquinolone and ethambutol. That was our preferred regimen. However, if the person had, uh, if a person showed a resistance to fluoroquinolone, then instead of levofloxacillin, we substituted moxifloxacillin in that regimen. And uh, somewhere in the middle of our, our treatment regimen, we ran short of ethambutol. Um, in appropriate dosages. So it was only available to us in 100 milligram tablets, which increased the pill burden massively uh, for these patients. So at that point, a decision was made to switch over from ethambutol to ethionamide until such time that ethambutol was available. Um, and the same uh, regimens were offered to both the children and the adults in appropriate dosages. 
One of the uh, very critical pathway in this patient and uh, interaction with us was the uh, counseling. Both the index patient and all of their contacts were uh, counseled for mode of transmission of tuberculosis, the risk to the close contacts, the importance of screening and importance of uh, starting contacts on the preventive therapy and the treatment adherence. So both the index patient and their contacts were counseled at baseline when they first came in for their clinical evaluation, then at the start of the treatment, then at the 15 days or two weeks after they've started the infection treatment, and then at every follow-up visit to the clinic. We provided about 600 Pakistani rupees, which is equivalent to about $6 uh, at, uh, of, as patient enabler, and this was primarily to cover their transport cost to the clinic uh, for the clinic visit. Uh, it was provided once at the baseline visit, once at the treatment initiation visit, and every two months follow-up. We collected all our data electronically for easy uh, access and immediate management. So now, the results of the study. So in total, we had to screen 181 households. Of those, 71 had to be excluded for various reasons listed in that box uh, that you see. Uh, 110 households were eligible for, uh, to participate in the study. Of those, 10 refused to participate. So our sample size of 100 was established. Um, Seven of those households refused to participate after the initial visits and initial verbal symptom screen. So 93 households were then evaluated further. Of those 14 households, there was, could not meet our eligibility criteria, so there was nobody in that household which were under five years of age or an adult with a malnourished um, um, condition. 20 refused to participate after investigation, so we started infection treatment in 59 of those, uh, of those households. In terms of individuals, from those 59 households, we had 80, 801 contacts. We approached 795 contacts. One refused to participate. 794 agreed to participate. We found nine people already on ATT when they visited their homes. Uh, and for 40 people, we were just unable to reach them due to various scheduling challenges. So we verbally screened 746 people. Of those, 409 were eligible for investigation. 336 were assessed clinically as well as investigated. Of these, two were diagnosed with MDR-TB and both were enrolled for the treatment. So our final sample size is of 208 eligible people of those nine further refused treatment. Of the 199, finally eligible and started on, uh, offered on treatment. 171 have started the treatment thus far. Uh, of these, 61 are zero to four years of age, 88 are five to, 70, five to 17 years of age, and 22 uh, are adults. 101 individuals have completed the infection treatment of six months. 25 are still on treatment. 42 discontinued treatment at various points during the treatment regimen, and only three patients were lost to follow-up, and that was primarily because they moved out of the city. Um, so we could not follow them anymore or could not provide them an infection treatment. Age and gender distribution of those that started on the uh, infection treatment, um, under five, we are at par between male and females, but we see a slight preponderance of males as we go forward into the age groups. And the reason for starting the infection treatment, as, as I mentioned earlier, we had a strict eligibility criteria. So uh, under five, we gave a blanket treatment. Five to 17, we detected four who had positive TST, and that's why they were started. But majority of them were started because they were malnourished. Um, over 17 years, um, similarly, we see that majority of the people were started on infection treatment because they were malnourished. So if I bring everything down, from all you have seen in those slides, to a cascade, uh, we see that of the 801 individual contacts identified, we conducted verbal screening for 
28% were eligible for preventive therapy. Of those, 100% was prescribed uh, therapy, uh, uh, prescribed preventive therapy, sorry, the above number eligible for preventive therapy should be 208, not 409. Uh, started preventive therapy, 82% uh, started preventive therapy um, from this. And of that, 59% have completed, 15% still on treatment, and 26% refused. Uh, the reasons for refusals. Um, at the screening or the evaluation point, it was primarily the work scheduling that came in, either with the academics, children were at school or people were at work and they couldn't be screened or they didn't want to come back to the clinics for the clinical investigation, which included chest x-ray and other tests. Um, some relocation, so they moved out of the area uh, that we were working in. And um, some perceived that we have minimal exposure to the index contact. So I don't want to take six months of medication because my exposure to that person is not to the MDRTB patient is not sufficient in their opinion. Reasons for uh, refusing infection treatment at initiation, so once they've gone through verbal screening, they've gone through the clinical investigation, and then they refused. And at that point, it was lack of interest due to being non-symptomatic. The other thing was minimal exposure to index patient as perceived by the individual. And the last was adverse event to a family members. So the family members not start all started treatment at the same time because of their own schedules. So if a family member started and had an adverse event, that led to um, a discontinuation for the entire household for us. And during the treatment, again, adverse event was the primary reason for the discontinuation. In addition to which, we saw that discouragement from other providers. So if they have an adverse event, if I have a GI symptom, I'm on treatment, and I go to my local provider, which is very close by to my home, that doctor obviously did not have the knowledge of what the preventive treatment was about, and they discouraged um, patients, um, people taking the preventive therapy. The adverse events that we saw by system, uh, GI was the prime majority of our patients uh, had GI symptoms. Of those, 18 or, um, or majority of them had, were due to levo and ethionamide regimen. So we did see um, patients who, were, who had levofloxacin and ethionamide uh, discontinuing treatment more than those that had levofloxacin and ethambutol, pretty much of what you just presented. Um, in terms of the monthly follow-up, we have a pretty good monthly follow-up uh, going on during our treatment for this cohort, um, over uh, close to 90% at all uh, visits. And some of our cohort have completed treatment. So at two months post-infection treatment, uh, we are still continuing to follow them every two months after they have completed treatment. So at the month two, which was the first visit, did nobody uh, reported any symptoms? Those uh, at month four, only one person uh, had a cough uh, for more than two weeks, which was evaluated but was not of uh, tuberculosis origin. And um, at six months, again, uh, nobody had any symptoms to report. Um, that was it, and I just want to acknowledge the team that has been hard at work to, um, to accomplish uh, what I've just presented, and some of them are actually sitting in the audience, so thank you very much for that, and I can take any questions. Thank you very much. That's a really impressive piece of work, huge amount of work to do all that, and, and also really Im interesting to see the, the kind of the drops in that cascade, which are just the challenges of doing this kind of routine work. So are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a fantastic um, presentation. A couple of quick things. Moxifloxacin, just do kids. Uh, how did you determine the dosing of 10 mg per kg? And um, was, did you have difficulty because it's tablets and not liquid? Some difficulty uh, because it's tablet and not liquids. Uh, I think we've used crushed up tablets. Uh, we would like to get hold of the levofloxacin in the, uh, I suspension, think it's coming in the yeah. suspension uh, form. 
Um, the dosage were determined by the clinical uh, team, and mm -hmm. uh, I think they used CDC guidelines and some other guidelines okay. that um, okay. were present. All right, and then the other thing is, um, for screening, did you use chest x-ray? Yes. Yeah, and all? On all contacts, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. Another question? Thank you for the presentation. My question is about, would you think about making a control group out of who refused treatment, not initiating the project, but who refused to get treatment, maybe a good group for control. Definitely. So you alluded to at the start that you were following up the people who weren't taking preventive therapy, but you haven't said anything about how that follow-up was, was done. So we didn't present that data, but that follow-up is ongoing, and we have not detected any disease uh, in that cohort as yet. And are they seen six monthly, is that? They, they're seen every two months, just like the regular cohort. Right, and so those who refused to carry on with preventive therapy, they agreed to being followed up? Did yes. They? Okay. Yeah. More questions? Um, quick question on the switching from the uh, Thambutol to the ethionamide. Did you have drug resistance testing in like your contacts with the INH and potential resistance in the ethionamide group? So we had drug resistance for uh, DSTs for the index patient. We didn't do them for the contacts. Uh, the switching reason was just primarily logistics, nothing else. It was because the tablets were not available to us in appropriate dosages, and the pill burden was very high with ethambutol. Once the regular dosage uh, tablet were available, we are actually, majority of the cohort prefers ethambutol uh, to ethionamide. Right, so for the index case, you did have the susceptibility yes, to Yes, certainly. Them. Great. Any more questions? Well, in that case, thank you very, very much, Mila. That was really interesting. Um, from this session, um, from some preliminary findings from the Phoenix trial from Amita Gupta. We're very excited to see these. Well, it's not the trial, but the feasibility before the trial. I wish I had some trial data. Um, so, <clears throat> good, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to pr uh, present on the Phoenix feasibility study. Um, so to start out with, uh, we're part of a large multi-country, um, multi-site team, um, and um, this is an NIH-funded trial that's going to be happening hopefully starting next year. And we have um, multiple sites that are involved, uh, 16 sites right now in um, three continents, eight countries, but that's expected to be 25 sites that'll join the trial um, starting next year. Um, so I think you've heard from our speakers previously that um, household contacts are obviously at high risk for TB infection and disease, and um, much of that disease occurs in the first two years after exposure. And so unfortunately, there's been variability in the policies, and as you heard um, from our first speaker, limited evidence on the quality of what to do with these contacts. Um, so. This is why I love, I, this has always been an issue at this conference, here we go. Um, so we know that WHO guidelines currently have a watch and wait, um, although those guidelines are expected to change very soon. Um, but that's been the current standard of care um, released by the WHO as to how to manage contacts um, to date. And so we are embarking on a Phoenix trial, which um, you heard briefly mentioned earlier in the, t um, in the session, where we're going to be looking, comparing delaminid once daily to isoniazid in um, those who are high-risk contacts, specifically children under five, those who are um, uh, TB infection positive either by TST or quantiferon, um, or who are HIV infected. Those are our three high-risk groups where we're going to be targeting, and we anticipate enrolling 3,452 contacts that are high-risk into this trial. It'll be, unfortunately, a few years before we have any data, um, and we plan to start next year. So in anticipation of this trial, one of the things we were asked to do was to uh, determine the site capacity, feasibility, and the characteristics of the index cases and the contacts in preparation for the trial. So we conducted something called a feasibility study, and I'll present those results today. 
uh, the main objectives of this were to describe the feasibility of identifying, recruiting, characterizing the index cases and their household, adult, and child contacts, and to describe the prevalence of LTBI, TB disease, HIV infection um, among these contacts. Um, we initially started out with a cross-sectional design, and I'll present those data today. The one-year follow-up data is forthcoming. Um, we had a target sample size of 300 adult index, uh, adult MDR pulmonary TB cases and all their household contacts. Um, we defined an index case as someone who was an adult with pulmonary MDR TB either by genotypic or phenotypic testing. And a household contact was defined as a person who lived in the same dwelling unit and shared the same housekeeping arrangements as the index case and reported exposure within the six months prior to the index case starting treatment. <clears throat> Um, we did a variety of uh, evaluations. We did um, looked at the MDR-TB caseload at each site, um, what kind of resources were utilized for this contact tracing. At the index case level, we looked at medical history, um, documented chest imaging, um, and their sputum for infectiousness. We looked at then among the contacts, we did household enumeration, medical history, documentation of HIV, and if they were not known, then they were offered HIV testing. We did TB infection testing uh, by both TST and IGRA, chest x-ray, and then also collected respiratory samples for TB diagnosis and conducted a knowledge, attitude, and practices um, survey as well. So the sites that participated uh, were, are shown here. So we had 16 sites. Um, the countries listed Botswana, Brazil, Haiti, Kenya, India, Peru, South Africa, Tanzania, Thailand, and Zimbabwe um, were participated. And um, we enrolled 308 index cases and 1,018 contacts in a five-month period, um, shown here. So we rapidly accrued, and the distribution by site is shown here. So the, the highest enrolling sites were South Africa, Peru, and India in the, in the study, with um, the red bar showing the index cases and the blue bar showing the household contact enrollment per, uh, per site. And in terms of um, how uh, the study went, so we approached 410 um, MDR-TB cases. Uh, we screened 396 and enrolled 308, and the various reasons for not enrolling were largely um, often because they um, just didn't have time or didn't have household contacts or were not interested in participating. Um, in terms of the household contacts, we enumerated of the 300 and um, uh, uh, Nine, I'm sorry, 305 household uh, index cases, rather. We enumerated 1,317 household contacts and enrolled 1,018 of them. Reasons for non-enrollment were largely because they did not want to participate in the research or were too busy, um, and that was the main reason for um, not enrolling um, many of the household contacts. So um, here is now starting with some results. Um, so of the 308 index cases, the median age was 36, and 43% um, were female. The distribution by country is shown here. Um, and then with household contacts, they tended to be younger, 26 years. 59% were female. So we tended, because we were going either to the home or they were more willing to participate often um, than um, the, the men in the study. So we had um, more uh, female predominance in, in the study. Oops. This is one. Yeah, okay. All right, so in summarizing um, index cases, where we found the index cases, um, half of them were found at community clinics, 16% at the general hospital, 11% um, were actually referred to the clinical research site, um, and um, the remaining came from other sources. Um, we enrolled most, 40% uh, of them act at the actual clinical research site, 33% at the hospital or clinic, usually a dot center, and 23% uh, in the home itself. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the lessons learned from the contact screening is that uh, of all the index cases, actually only three quarters of them, or 75%, actually had confirmed rifampin and INH resistance. Many of them, all of them were rifampin resistant based on sort of expert screening in the community. However, not everybody had INH confirmation in the community. So that's one thing we are going to hope to confirm um, as part of the trial. We realize that many patients are getting started on MDR treatment just on the basis of a gene expert result. Um, 
So <clears throat> those are one of the things. In terms of these index cases, 8% of, 36% uh, of them were HIV infected, 8% had diabetes, and um, interestingly, 48% uh, uh, had no prior TB. So these were recently transmitted cases, um, not necessarily treatment failure cases um, in these populations. And um, at the time of when we enrolled them, um, uh, there was evidence of 70% uh, had documented smear positivity and 51% um, were expert positive at the time that they, um, uh, or their, their um, prior records showed that they'd been expert positive as well, and 27% were culture positive. In terms of the age distribution of the contacts enrolled, 11% were under the age of five, and then 25% were five to less than 18. Um, the remainder were adults 18 and older. One of the things we, as I mentioned, we offered HIV testing to the contacts. Um, of the contacts, um, 790 of them, or 78%, had an unknown HIV status. Um, 772 were offered HIV testing, of which 28% actually declined wanting to be tested um, for HIV, and we were able to agree to um, having the other remaining 553 get tested. As a result of that, we found 5% um, uh, we found 5% um, new infections among those tested, um, and I show that here. So we had variable uptake. There was certainly site variability in terms of who was willing to get tested or not for HIV. Um, we found 26 new infections, and reasons primarily for not getting tested included either um, pair, these were children where the parent or the guardian did not want their child to be tested or they just um, thought that they were low risk, neither parent was infected, or um, actually interestingly enough, some sites had no IRB approval to actually do HIV testing in young children. And um, there was, or uh, as I mentioned, the parent felt their, their child was not at risk. So we want to ensure that we can also optimize HIV testing at these sites. In terms of TB infection results, um, so um, for 300, no TST was done. This was largely because of a shortage, a worldwide shortage that plagued our study, which has been a real problem with getting TST in some countries. Um, we were able to do TST testing in 64% or 705 individuals, of which 56% um, percent, uh, were found to be TST positive. Um, in terms of IGRA, we had a much better success rate of being able to do the IGRA, of which um, 973 were tested and 629 or 65% were IGRA positive. This was the quantiferon golden tube third generation test um, at the time of the study. So in essence, we found 70% um, or 708 of our contacts tested were positive by either TST or IGRA in this population. So a large proportion were already um, had evidence of TB infection. There was some variation, as shown here by country, um, of the TST results as well as the IGRA. You can see a range from IGRA, for example, from 47% to as high as 80% being positive. Um, and for TST, um, Peru did not, was not able to do the testing, but we had quite a range from 8% all the way up to 65%, suggesting some problems with the TST um, implementation as well, which is also something we're going to improve for the trial. In terms of um, what we found among the contacts, um, so we found 23% of the household contacts had some sign or symptom um, thought to be related to possibly to TB. So cough, fever, night sweats, um, weight loss. And um, interestingly enough, that was equally distributed among children versus adults. So same 23% of those under 15 versus 24% of those over 15 had some sign or symptom. We did a good job of getting chest x-rays. 96% of them got a screening chest x-ray. 91% were good quality, of which 17% were abnormal. Um, and many of those were abnormal um, in children, particularly less than 15 years, where they had a chest x-ray suggestive of TB. A reason for not getting chest x-ray included pregnancy. Uh, 16 women uh, were refused to get a chest x-ray or their provider felt uncomfortable doing the chest x-ray because the contact was pregnant. In terms of um, yield of the contact tracing, we found 13% um, of prevalent TB cases um, and they represented um, 83 households um, of the 284 households that had a contact. Um, 
And interestingly enough, um, a large proportion, and this is actually quite the challenge with these types of studies, is determining um, TB in young children, um, where we ended up with really largely symptoms and chest X-ray findings and categorizing them as possible TB. So 7% or 71 of them, all children, um, met that criteria of possible TB. For probable TB, we found 3%, and we found 3% to have confirmed prevalent TB, including nine that were already on treatment and diagnosed um, in the study. The yield of contact tracing varied by site. And this just shows the age um, uh, distribution of the prevalent TB and by um, certainty of the category and classification. So obviously the largest number contributing to prevalent TB are the children under five. However, they were largely, as I mentioned, possible TB with only a small percent being confirmed. And, um, and, and then the five to 15 were the second. So this really emphasizes the importance of including children in any um, trial of prophylaxis because of the, the risk of progression and the risk certainly of prevalent TB is so high um, in, in young children. Um, the risk factors, are, we just did a, an analysis to look at risk factors for these who developed uh, prevalent TB. So sex, um, males more so than females, having LTBI either by TST or IGRA, 16% versus 10% for being TST positive, being IGRA was 14% versus 8%. Um, age, um, the risk factor um, in terms of age was certainly associated with increased risk, but um, age in terms of looking at um, the relative proportions um, uh, differed, but not, um, uh, not by confirmed or probable status. And then there was no difference by HIV um, status and no difference by high risk group in terms of the proportions of prevalent TB. Um, so ultimately, as a result of this study and in participation of our trial, we had determined that two-thirds of household contacts would meet a high-risk category. So um, when we were to, when we were about to start, we expect that two um, household contact, two-thirds of any household would have a high risk, either a child under five, um, a, uh, an HIV-infected individual, or an LTBI-positive individual for whom we could target the prophylaxis. Um, just two quick minutes about um, willingness to take preventive therapy. So we also conducted a, a survey among the adult um, um, contacts to see if they would be willing to take preventive therapy. So 741 household contacts were surveyed, and by and large, 79% had a high, um, were willing to take um, preventive therapy. So that it, um, that's a good sign. Reasons for not being interested to take therapy included low education, um, being unemployed and um, um, sort of coming uh, from a household that had not disclosed the TB and were concerned about stigma. So I'll end by saying that we learned lots of things from our um, feasibility study, TST access, uptake of HIV testing, recruitment of children, lots of travel logistics to meet people and their household contacts in different venues. Um, there were concerns about occupational risk of staff and teams going out into the community and interacting with drug-resistant patients and certainly um, some issues of um, even individual households, particularly if they live in densely populated areas where they have stick concerns of people coming into their home and, and sort of stigmatize, why are these people coming to visit? So all of these things we have to address as we move forward with the trial. So I wanted to thank you for your attention and um, open, oops, there we go. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and really goes to show the importance of doing these feasibility studies. So although they're expensive, if you hadn't known all that stuff when you, and you just embarked on the trial, you, you would have gone down a lot of wrong roads, wouldn't you, I think? Yeah. Well, we'll see if we can fix all of them. <laughs> Hi, Amita. Thanks for that talk. It was very good. Um, a couple of things. Um, I have been involved with voluntary medical male circumcision, which is not related to this, other than uh, when people get offered HIV and they refuse, there's a high acceptance rate upon a reoffer. So something to potentially think about okay. for when you um, move into your trial. Just keep asking. Yeah, and, yeah, keep you know, asking. Without, keep offering. Without, you know, keep offering. Being okay. too uh, uh, aggressive, but uh, many times it's just a lot going on, and if you get them at another time when some of the other things that That's are new great. to them are, are resolved, then uh, perhaps uh, they may accept. Um, what is uh, the other question? Is this the case finding rates pretty staggering? 
um, in, in, in this, the number of kids that you found uh, and people that you found with TB. So uh, upon doing this study and this, this study and the coming study, you are now pr placing um, a good bit more burden on the local uh, TB control program with regard to attention that they're going to need to uh, pay to really hard to treat patients and needs for drugs. How is that being addressed in the context of these trials? So you're, are you talking about the treatment of the index cases? Well, the ones, the new, the new cases oh, that the new you cases. found that is probably above and beyond of what would normally be present in the particular TB control programs. Yeah, so, well, I mean, I think we, we the, 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 what I would say to that is that obviously as diagnostics are getting better and better and the more cases we're finding, there, obviously many of these sites are overburdened as it is. Um, in the context of a study, we have a lot more follow-up and sort of linkage to care and we're actually you know, going to be documenting as we find cases what exactly has happened to their linkage, have they gone to care to improve, um, to at least facilitate that as best as possible and improve on the standard of care. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your comments. It was a really great presentation, very exciting. We really look forward to the, the sort of main trial. Um, I just have a question about your confirmed co-prevalent cases. Yes. Um, I think it was about 26 of them, is that right? Um, particularly in the adults, I was just wondering what the um, uh, the agreement between the index case and the <laughs> contact was. I mean, are all those 26 yeah. drug resistant, what proportion of drug sensitive? Yeah, so great question. Um, we're actually looking at that data right now in terms of the, um, the similarity. And, and, and <clears throat> so what we know is that um, those that were children tended to be more drug resistant as expected from the literature consistent with that. Um, for the adults, um, right now, I mean, I don't, I have preliminary data, and I have Sion Kim who's back, and she's a statistician for the study. Um, we're still looking at confirming because we have to get some additional records and um, d drug susceptibility testing being done on the co-prevalent cases. So I, I can't tell you the exact ratio right now. Yeah, so we had wanted to sequence them. Um, we don't have access to all the isolates, but we are going to try to sequence the few that we have. I think if the numbers are relatively small. Um, the, the issue is we don't have all the index case isolates. We have built we have built that into the trial. Just one other quick one, if I may. I was just interested by your the fact that HIV status didn't affect the proportion of um, co-prevalent cases. I was wondering, are they all on ART or HIV cases or? Yeah, I, you know, I don't have I don't know off the top of my head if I think many of them were. We had, as I said, five percent new cases identified. They obviously were not yeah. on ART at the time. Um, but, uh, you know, what's interesting is that because many of the sites actually had relatively low HIV prevalence in, um, in you know, Peru and India, for example, where we did these studies, South Africa was where, and Botswana uh, were where we had many more um, of the proportion. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, we, we ha I can't say for sure, but that's certainly what we think is part of it, is that those who were known to be HIV infected were being treated. The lovely uh, studies, this one and the one before. Uh, the previous uh, speaker just took my question away, but I wanted to ask, I say, I've noticed that most times when I do diagnose a patient MDR and I follow up the contacts and I find someone who's got a prevalent TB, they may be on first-line TB treatment, maybe diagnosed by smear, and sometimes already they're failing that treatment, and then usually if you switch to the regimen which the index case is having, the patient does well. So I wanted to say, did you contact the, the attending physician for the contacts to, to make them aware that they have a contact who's actually confirmed DRTB so that maybe they actually investigate for DRTB and maybe put on appropriate regimen. Yeah, yeah. so um, as we found cases, we certainly were in direct contact with providers. Um, there was, a, and, and some of the sites take care of those, they're co-located with the TB clinic and um, so we, we did try to do our best with linking them and, and ensuring they knew that these were contacts. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing all this work with us. Um, uh, I mean, ob obviously, part of the point of what you're doing here is to, to try to address some of the issues that have come up. And I'm particularly curious about um, the, uh, the big differences uh, in willingness to accept the therapy by, uh, by country. Uh, it, it, it may be too early, but I mean, do you have thoughts either about how you might modify which countries actually progress to be in the study or interventions you might use to try to improve? Yeah. The so there is one outlier um, site um, but basically beyond that, and, and there we, we were sort of 
that outlier was so an outlier that we're um, revisiting um, whether or not that was really sort of accurate representation of that response. Um, <clears throat> because the majority actually were in favor of being um, treated. We have a lot of site eligibility criteria and capacity that um, is needed because this is a large, very intense trial. Um, and so there are a lot of steps that, um, one, they have to have a suitable number of MDR cases. They have to have good diagnostics, good linkage for care, um, the ability to do, we're, we're, you know, for delaminid, we have to do EKGs and uh, a variety of other things. So um, these are all part of a big, large, uh, two large networks that the NIH funds, AIDS Clinical Trials Group and the Impact Network. So there's actually a fair amount of um, site capacity already there. And we are working particularly on the pediatric component. I think many of these are adult sites um, where doing household uh, tracing and engagement with children is more of a challenge. Um, so that's one thing we're really trying to work on, and we're doing a lot of um, training over the next six months. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I just have one clarification I wanted to get from you. Uh, you looked at the willingness to receive uh, preventive therapy, and uh, I wanted to know what, uh, if you went ahead and provided preventive therapy to, to the contacts, and as far as I know, I come from Uganda, and our guidance says we do not provide the uh, prophylaxis to MDR contacts. So I would like to know if uh, it's a recommendation that we, we give it, and which uh, prophylaxis do we give to MDR contacts? Yeah, so great question. Um, to my knowledge, of all the sites in, uh, that were listed, South Africa has a policy, at least at some of the sites, where they do three drug prophylaxis, particularly to children. So Simone Schaff has published on that, James Seddon. Um, and so they, they often use a combination of fluoroquinolide, um, uh, ethanamide, and um, uh, is it high dose INH um, as the three drugs. But they're not, most of these sites don't have um, routine prophylaxis being offered to the MDR contacts. So currently, many of them do a watch and wait. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great talk. Um, I have one observation and two questions. One observation is that the presentation from Pakistan seemed to show that there was about 13 household contacts elicited per case, whereas in your sites, it looks like there was like three or four contacts per case. And I'm wondering, did that differ by site or significantly, or are you missing? Are you talking about the household size? Yeah. Or, um, and, and, yeah. yeah, yeah, it probably has to do with household size. Yeah, so you know, we had a lot of heterogeneity in the types Among of, um, in mm -hmm. terms of the household structures. We, most of median size was five, um, um, and that's not so different um, uh, from, um, from something, but there were some households with up to 22 members. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and I think that has to do with, for example, what you define as a household. Right. Um, and that's another thing. Like in South Africa, you can have households where there's an, ex uh, an external structure and whether you, you know, uh, and they may share housekeeping arrangements, mm -hmm. but they're not necessarily all the, under the same roof. And in Indian settings, depending on where you go, there could be a joint extended family um, with multiple members, where, um, whereas other places, there were very few. Um, okay. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, We can maybe ask some of the team for Pakistan, but um, my understanding is that they also include s close social contacts in addition ah, okay. to household contacts. All right. Oh, that in that makes Pakistan, sense. Sorry, go ahead. Eight. Eight. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Larger okay. households. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, you have some really interesting data in TST IGRA comparison. Yes. Can you, are you going to be able to look at that uh, with relation to which sites you're using BC? have BCG vaccinated versus not? Yeah, so you mean, well, we, we don't have, well, I think we, I don't know if we have these, we, we can only assume by the country policy. Yes. Um, most of the sites actually do BCG. Um, okay. And so uh, what we will look at is concordance, discordance, and, um, and if there's any, you know, factors associated with that. I think one of the important things, what we also realize is if you only use one test, you have a very different proportion who will be LTBI infected. Right. Um, yes. Using one or the other to be positive mm -hmm. actually increases it quite right. a bit. So is that what you're planning to do? In other words, yeah. if a contact has either or Correct. positive, you're going to put We're going to include them. them, yes. Yeah, that's going to be interesting because some of those are going to be, you know, false positive for if you if you have the quantiferon negative TS positive. I mean, just a thought. The other thing is delaminate in the kids, less than five, then is how yeah, so um, we've given a happen. lot of, so there's a, been a lot of work going on to delaminate dosing. 
Um, so Atsuka has just um, has uh, been doing the younger age groups okay. in terms of enrollments. So we have interim PK data, and then we've used okay. modeling with Uppsala to estimate the dosing Great. for the very young kids. There was okay. a pediatric <laughs> session yesterday or the day before where um, uh, Jeff Hatfield from Atsuka presented some of the pharmacokinetic data from their studies looking at the three to six-year-olds, and they're, they're currently recruiting the zero to three-year-olds. So I think within a relatively short period of time, we'll have a good idea of what dosages of um, delaminid to be giving to children. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank Any you. further questions? Well, thank you very much. Okay.